Okay, so thank you everyone today for joining. I am Susan, I'm a co-founder of the U of T Trash Team and program lead for our volunteer engagement and community programs, which you'll learn a little bit more about our work shortly. We are joined today by partner organizations from the Toronto Inner Harbor Floatable Strategy, who will share more about the work we're doing to pl prevent plastic pollution in Lake Ontario, as well as to start a dialogue with all of you about similar initiatives across Canada. And we're thrilled to welcome everyone to get a chance to learn more about you. First, it's important to take a moment to recognize the lands on which we are gathering, and we acknowledge the diverse and unique groups of Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. In our local work, we acknowledge we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the William Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. As we are all gathering from across Turtle Island, we have a resource that we encourage you to have a look at to take a deeper look at the traditional territory we work within. And a starting point many of you are likely familiar with is nativeland.ca, which I believe Rafaela has shared in the chat for those who'd like to, to visit. Um, so today our workshop has been made possible with support from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation's Reduction of Marine Litter Project, and they've been working in Canada, the US, and Mexico to bring more attention to local land-based sources of marine litter, and with that we have introduced a new trash trap in Toronto called the Osprey Litter Booms. We have Catherine from the CEC joining us today, and she'll share some more details on their work, as well as resources in your community, which includes one of their fantastic campaigns, Last Stop the Ocean, which um, talks about the journey of litter into the ocean. And it is our privilege to work along the shores of Lake Ontario and lead the strategy in collaboration with some incredible organizations. So thank you to everyone involved. We're very thrilled that we can share our work and learn from each other on uh, collaborative strategies to work locally through prevention and cleanup. And before we get into today's workshop agenda, very short introduction to the UFT Trash Team. Uh, for those not familiar with us, we formed back in 2017 in collaboration with the Rockman Lab at the University. And we are a science-based community outreach organization with a common goal to increase waste literacy as a way to reduce plastic pollution. And our work is supported by a team of volunteers, students, early career researchers, and our core staff who highlight our main work streams. So we have uh, Chelsea, myself, and Rafaela, who are co-founders of the team and lead our solutions-based research, community outreach, and education program, respectively, though there's a lot of crossover as well. And Hannah works alongside our organization and OSHA Conservancy to facilitate the International Trash Tap Network, which you'll learn more about uh, shortly. And through all that we do, scientific evidence provides the foundation for our work. So that brings us to today's workshop. And our objectives are to share our local floatable strategy with all of you, and then provide a platform for discussion and ultimately work to encourage similar strategies across Canada and have a forum for us to all learn from each other. And I'd like to do a very short welcome to our speakers for today's workshop. We're very um, honored to welcome MP Julie DeBrusen, who will speak with us today for a special keynote. And uh, we'll provide a more detailed um, introduction to each of our speakers when it's their um, opportunity to talk. So thank you, Julie, for joining. And we also have speakers from some of the many organizations who represent the Toronto Inner Harbor Floatable Strategy. We have Chelsea from also from the UFT Trash Team, Chaya and Stephanie with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, Jessica of Ports Toronto, and Megan of Swim Drink Fish. As well, we're thrilled to welcome Catherine Boyd Michaud from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And uh, as mentioned, I'll share a little bit more about them prior to their portions. So that brings me to today's agenda. Um, soon, Chelsea will come and speak to provide more context about the local and global issues of plastic pollution, which will be followed by our keynote from MP Julie DeBrusen to learn and share more about Canada's initiatives to tackle plastic pollution. And we won't have a formal Q&A up until this point. Um, we may have a bit of time for questions, but we encourage you, if you'd like to use the chat, um, you can do so, and we'll keep a copy of those chats with um, questions, which we'll get to in the second half of today's workshop, which starts with an introduction to the Toronto Inner Harbor Floatable Strategy, and then a deeper look at some of our specific actions. At that point, we'll have a Q&A, and I'll share more details about how that will work. 
Um, and but right before we then get into the final portion, which is where you'll all have a chance for facilitated discussion, we'll have a quick stretch break. Um, and then today's workshop will wrap up with a high level summary and some closing words from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. Um, we'll review this when it's time, but just to give you a heads up, for Q&A, we'll go back and forth between chat and out loud. So if you'd like to ask questions out loud, you can use the raise hand so that we can take you um, uh, and unmute you. And then for chat, feel free to continually ask questions throughout the workshop and we will, uh, Rafaela has so kindly offered to keep a track of your questions and we can get to them. Um, so. As we're all keen to get started, we have two short Mentimeter questions. So I'll give everyone a chance right now before I flip the screen over to take this information and get ready to start answering them. So you won't see the question just yet, but we will be asking you more about the type of group you're representing and you're able to elaborate on that in the chat because it's just a drop down. So you can share more after answering there. And then we'd love to learn more about why you wanted to join today's workshop and some of your motivations, either a single word or a short statement. So I will go to the Mentimeter now. Um, I'll just double check the chat to make sure everyone, okay, doesn't seem like any technical issues. So let's go ahead. <clears throat> There we go. Everyone should be seeing those responses coming up on the screen. <clears throat> okay, so I'll leave this up for a moment before we go to the next question, um, just to see we have some uh, government representation and nonprofits, um, as well as some industry and universities. And as mentioned, if you'd like to elaborate in the chat, though some of you already shared earlier, um, that's great. Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, as we think about more of our motivations and from the first slide, you know, where's, we recognize there's lots of different types of groups that can be involved and it's something we encourage that collaboration is very important and we really look forward to learning more about groups that um, we may be not aware of uh, that we can connect with and talk about these issues. So let's see some of these motivation responses popping in as they come through. Okay, so certainly some general learning goals to see more about what opportunities are out there. Um, so collaboration is definitely a word popping up in a number of these responses. Hear about what's happening, um, understand some of the research behind things. Oh, wow, this is moving. Okay, I'm going to scroll up a little bit to get to some of them. Um, do better, uh, enhance, learn ways to educate the public. And we'll certainly get to most of these topics today, which is very reassuring. So that's amazing. Okay, so we're a very highly motivated group. So what I will do now is I will turn it over to our next speaker so that we can continue on. Um, and we look forward to hearing more of everyone's input during our facilitated discussion. So I'll introduce Chelsea Rockman, who is our head of operations and program lead of scientific programming and application for the UFT trash team, as well as an assistant professor at the university. She's been representing research, sorry, researching the sources, sinks, and ecological implications of plastic debris for more than a decade and works to translate science beyond academia. So it's my pleasure. Please welcome Chelsea. Thank you. And can you see my screen and what you think I want you to see? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's really, really wonderful to see everyone in this room. Um, Susan shared sort of our motivation for this workshop, which is to share what we're all doing locally to be able to increase our global impact. And I wanted to start off with basically a talk that talked about the motivation for all the work that we do. A lot of you are not new to plastic pollution, however, so I don't want to bore you with things you know. So I thought I would tell a bit of a personal story about my journey through researching plastic pollution and how that's led me to, to really feel that there's a real importance to work locally. So for me, I've been researching plastic pollution uh, since undergrad, really. Um, when I got 
over 15 years ago now, um, when I got really interested in plastic pollution in the ocean. So I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, where there's not a lot of water. Um, I studied at the University of California, San Diego, because I wanted to be on the ocean. I was always interested in waste, always interested in ocean. And when I studied abroad in Australia, my two loves came together, and that was garbage and the ocean. Uh, studying abroad, working on remote islands, I saw beaches covered in plastic. I wanted to understand why, and our professor asked us to write a research proposal on anything. So I Googled plastic, and I Googled ocean, and I came across what some of you may be familiar with, and that was the garbage patches in the middle of the ocean. And for me, it was learning about those, as they called them, plastic islands, thousands of miles out to sea, that really inspired me to work on this issue in my career. So I decided to go to graduate school to do some research on this topic, to increase our knowledge, to be able to inform solutions. And I went down the street to San Diego State University, but I still had connection to UC San Diego and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. The grad students at Scripps invited um, one of the explorers and founders of the Garbage Patch to give a presentation at Scripps, which inspired a research vessel to go out to the Garbage Patch. So the grad students at Scripps wrote a proposal to have a student run cruise to the garbage patch and they won. And we set sail in the summer of 2009. And as someone down the street and who they knew was obsessed with this issue, they invited me to go along. So I had the opportunity to go and try to understand plastic in the middle of the ocean. At the time, that's really what we were thinking about when we thought about this issue. We got to the garbage patch. It looked nothing like it had been described. It was not an island of garbage that you could easily scoop up. From the bow of the ship on a clear, calm day, it looked like the image you see here, bright blue water with small pieces of plastic confetti as far as the eye can see, the size of a pencil eraser and smaller. And for those of you that know me, I spend most of my time thinking and researching and dreaming about microplastic. Um, but of course, I also work on the big plastic as well. But the reason for that is because over time, plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, and these microplastics have become a really global issue. Now, in looking at a vision like this, I thought, I don't want to work in the middle of the ocean where there's a biological desert. I want to work closer to land at the source so I can prevent the litter from getting out here and to work closer to where the organisms are. We know today that plastic pollution is a global issue. Yes, it's everywhere in the ocean, from the surface to the deep sea, from the garbage patches to the coast. But as plastic um, starts from land, it also contaminates land, it contaminates freshwater. And as it breaks down over time, it cycles in the global dust cycle as microplastic, it cycles in the water cycle, it moves through the food web, which means animals are exposed and it reaches our plates um, when we you know, drink water from these contaminated sites and eat seafood from these contaminated sites. So I've spent most of my career trying to understand risk and to understand how that risk um, can inform or should inform solutions and also working locally to think about what those solutions are. So when we think about plastic in the environment, of course, the concentrations and the amounts will vary based on where you are. Yes, we have high amounts in the garbage patches because the currents bring it there, but there's also a lot close to land, uh, close to the source, and that includes right here at home for, for us, at least in our Great Lakes. The Great Lakes have a lot of plastic pollution. They are very close to the source, many major cities, and they are less dilute than the oceans. So I started as a marine ecologist, but today I'm not, except for in my teaching. I really spend a lot of time in freshwater. So I'll walk you through some of what I found in terms of exposure and risk. In my beginning of my studies in 2008 in the garbage patch, uh, we sampled fish, we sampled mctophid, lantern fishes. We found plastic in one in 10 fish in that region and the amount of plastic was about one to three pieces per organism, per animal. In San Francisco, a few years later, I went to fish markets to try to understand how much plastic might be coming to us on our dinner plates. We sampled fish from the markets, we took the gut content, and I found plastic in about three in 10 fish, maybe four pieces per individual. Here at home in the Great Lakes, I find plastic in every single fish I sample alongside the government and their sport fish monitoring program. And sometimes we find more than 100 pieces in the stomach of an individual fish. 
And we know today from the literature, well, we know from images that large plastic impacts wildlife. You've all seen entanglement or an animal full of plastic bags. But we also know that from many, many studies looking at microplastics, that these plastics do indeed can cause harm. And we now understand the concentrations that can cause risk. And so on the left, you can see places in the ocean that will, that either do um, have measurable risk or will in the future if we continue business as usual in the red. And on the right, every dot is a sample from the Great Lakes and each line is a risk threshold. And you can see lots of places in Lake Ontario specifically, but across many lakes where those thresholds have been crossed. So there is no doubt that it is time to act. And as a researcher, I didn't just want to do my science in a bubble. I wanted to make a difference. And I think of several bins of which we can use to make a difference, pun intended. And that would be reduction of plastic waste, which includes single use items, but also simply reusing. So you reduce the waste that you make. Management like curbside uh, collection and landfills, which of course are not the best, but they're better than the environment, but then also thinking about recycling in ways in which we can manage more sustainably and cleanup. I know sometimes cleanup gets a bad name as a type of the solution, but the reality is today we need it. And cleanup is also a form of monitoring to inform upstream solutions. I am incredibly thrilled that several years after I've started my career, there is many, many forms of policy and management actions happening. That includes at the municipal level, the provincial level, the federal level, and the global level. And MP Julie DeBrusen will talk about some of her leadership in this space. For us, we were inspired to work locally to inform these measures. And we were inspired by Mr. Trashwheel. I think if you're not familiar, Rafaela will put a, a website for this in the chat. It's an excellent education and outreach tool. It does wonderful cleanup in the Baltimore Harbor. And the data that it collects has informed local legislation, including a ban on styrofoam containers in Maryland. We were insti inspired by this to start our own local organization. And we'll talk about our local work today and how it has inspired greater work into global, the global arena. And so hopefully, you know, just being able to share what we share and be able to learn what you do, um, we can all think about ways in which we can take this global issue um, it is time to act and work together to form a solution. So thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna actually, I have the pleasure of introducing MP DeBrusen. And one second. Okay, so hopefully you can see uh, Julie DeBrusen here on the screen. And Julie DeBrusen is a local MP of Toronto in the Toronto Danforth riding. Prior to becoming a member of parliament, Julie practiced law, so her expertise is in legal. She left her practice to raise her daughters and participate more actively in her local community, where she quickly became known as a strong community leader and even earned the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award for her community service in 2013. Julie was elected a couple years later in 2015 to parliament. She works on several issues. I don't want to spend time talking about that today so I can give her more time to talk but she's an expert in modernizing SEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which includes a lot of the work on plastic federally that you've heard about in the newspaper. And she also leads stakeholder groups to hear from stakeholders about the issues of plastic so she can bring that information back to Ottawa. On a personal note, um, I often call her Julie because she is also my MP and she truly is an amazing community member. You go into a coffee shop, you see her, everyone knows her name, she knows your name, she sits down, she listens to her constituents, and she does take that information back to her in Ottawa. She's also a huge supporter of the U of T trash team in terms of coming to cleanups and actively cleaning, coming to visit our research lab, talking to my students, and having conversations with me about the issue. So Julie, thank you so much for coming, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you um, to go ahead and talk. Thank you. And you know what? <clears throat> Sorry. I'm going to say, I think my highlight is going to be that I just learned something about you, Chelsea, which is so many people when their students are talking about organizing cruises, it is not the same as what you said you did when you were organizing a, a cruise out to uh, the, the plastic island out there. So kind of funny facts we learn around the way. But I think um, if I can start, I think some important pieces when we talk about even the cleanups, a lot of the places where I've interacted with the U of T trash team along the way, but also with shoreline cleanup and a lot of other organizations is that 
there's something to be said about doing these cleanups, not just to get rid of plastics that are entering our waterways and our environment, but also as a way of building up advocacy and for people to see and to learn more. I think it's a great, very tangible touch point. And I think that that's helpful. And I always love seeing, for example, at a lot of the cleanups that we've had, even in Toronto, we have Don't Mess With The Dawn, you tea trash team out there, also educating people more about the, the larger picture of what they're doing. So I, I, I'm always a big fan of, of cleanups and, and doing that as an entry point to talk about more about plastics. I say that because really about less than 10 years ago, plastics really became a topic people started talking about more. And so as an example, I think it's a great example of um, community advocacy and how people can actually make their voices heard on things. The example I use is in 2015, when, when my government, the federal government right now was elected, it wasn't in our platform to, to work on plastics. That wasn't part of what we had lined up. But by 2019, so before the next election, it was already a commitment. And that came from a lot of people in organizations like the ones who are participating today, really amplifying that this was something that needed to be worked on. And I saw in the list, one of the top issues people were raising was collaboration. And I think it's a good example of how collaboration can really work to, to amplify things. So I mentioned 2019. There are a few things that right around that time came up. Uh, in 20, I'm going to talk a little bit domestic, a little bit international. But in just before 2019, we committed to banning certain single use plastics. And on that front, as of the end of last year, we banned the manufacture and importation of certain single use plastics being checkout bags, cutlery, food service wear, stir sticks, straws and ring carriers. And as of the end of this year, it would be also for the sale of all of those products. So that's a that was a big step and, and it was and I've noticed already leading into the past year that I'm seeing less like I haven't seen a plastic stir stick recently. So just things have been starting to change a lot. Now, it's also fair to say that none of these things go without some bumps on the road. And there has been a court case just recently that challenged um, challenged the single use plastics ban. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to hear that we're going to be appealing that court decision, which put that single use plastics ban into question because it was disappointing. We know that Canadians actually care about this. I, I have seen very few Canadians up in arms about not having plastic stir sticks, for example. So it's something that we're going to continue to work on domestically with that ban. But there are some other things that we're also working on. I just wanted to make sure that uh, people know about because a lot of the times um, the work that I've been doing now has been on the next steps. So, for example, how do we increase recycled content? into the products that we make uh, with that are plastics. Also, um, how do we better label plastics as recyclable? I find it so terribly confusing, and I know a lot of people find it so terribly confusing. What's recyclable, what isn't? You know, we've been working a lot on how can we do a, create a better system with a target that labeling would be, you would only be able to market as recyclable in Canada if it was actually recyclable in 80% or more of facilities in our country. So those are the kinds of things we've been trying to work towards. Also, better data. The scientists in the room are probably all about the data. It's not the thing that gets very ex exciting for people all the time to talk about, but we need the data to know what we're dealing with and how to confront it. So domestically, those are the big pieces. Think, like I said, the ban on certain single-use plastics and then working towards labeling recycled content and better data internationally and this one's the part I get really excited about because there's a big moment coming forward for Canada this spring right after my birthday in April um, and that is that we are uh, working on an international global charter to end plastic waste and Canada is part of the high ambition coalition it's kind of exciting because on my last count we're over 60 countries We've signed on to be a high ambition coalition towards ending plastic waste. We've had three rounds of negotiations so far. The last one was in Nairobi just last week. Um, and the next one, that's where I get really excited. The next one's going to be in Canada. It's going to be in Ottawa the week of April 21st. 
So that's something to mark in your calendars. I think it'll be a really big moment to be able to highlight Canadian leadership and Canadian innovation and advocacy. Uh, I'm really looking at how can we make sure that we have a strong Canadian pavilion type of idea so that we can really make sure that all of the organizations that are doing work in this area can be highlighted. Uh, but it's also a chance for Canada to show leadership. It'll be the second to last round of negotiations towards the international treaty. It will be one more round after after ours. But look at that as a moment. I will say, because I, I think it's always fair to point out where there are the bumps in the road again. The last one in Nairobi was not entirely smooth. So we didn't make as much progress as we'd hoped we would make. Um, and we didn't get agreements to even have those you know, official intercessional meetings in between the two negotiations of Nairobi and Ottawa to move things forward. So we've hit, we've hit some bumps as far as pushing it along. I don't think they're insurmountable. I just think it's really fair that everyone know that it's, it's not something that is easy to do. We're making progress, but it's not easy to do. So I, the main piece is making sure the High Ambition Coalition sticks together and really pushes forward. And that when we come together in Ottawa, we have a real moment to finalize a deal that will show glo global leadership on ending plastic waste. I think one thing that I find really important to that is if we can get the world to a certain point on it, it helps us domestically too. Being right now, we've been ahead of most countries on the work that we're doing. It's helpful if we can bring along other countries too, just to be able to get more strength and moving on it. So on that piece, because I wanted to be able to leave a moment for some questions if there was some, but the big piece is going forward to keep an eye on. April 21st, that week, Ottawa, a chance for all eyes to be on Canada and all of the work that organizations like the ones that are collaborating today will be a part of. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for pointing out, I think, you know, talking about some of the bumps in the road, but also some of the wins. And if people do have questions, please write them in the chat um, to facilitate it. When I see that question, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll read it out. But to get started um, in thinking about, I guess, how local organization can help with some of these bumps in the roads, you know, what are ways that you would tell local community groups, uh, the public, how to get in touch with the government to actually, I guess, advocate for either the facts that they create or even just their opinions. You know, how much, how much, what, what can we do, I guess, as citizens in order to help uh, some of these move forward? That's a good one because not everyone kind of realizes how effective certain things that are pretty simple can be. So I'll use the example of writing a letter to your own MP. A lot of people will write a letter to the minister, they'll write a letter to the prime minister, but they don't include even as a CC, their own personal MP. But that, that MP is the one who represents you. They all represent you, but they're the ones who are your most direct contact. And we do notice, we all take note of how many emails we're getting on a certain topic. And it becomes sometimes a lead way to have another conversation, particularly if you're involved in an organization, you're a scientist, an academic working on it, you can bring a certain amount of knowledge to educate your MP on these issues. You can have a, you can actually make things change. And a lot of it's very local and not partisan, right? Like these are very, they can, they can be very um, tangible, recognizable issues. People can see the plastics in their area and understand what the impact is. So I'd say with that, the other piece is you can actually federally bring petitions that are pretty easy to do, not the change.org types. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But if you go to the website, and I'll put it in the in the chat, our comments, uh, you can actually start a petition, probably work with your MP so that you can get it right as to how the formatting of it all works. But it's pretty easy. And if you get 500 signatures or more, then the government has to respond. I did not know that second part. That's really interesting. I always tell my students, write letters to your MP and I, I have done it and it makes a difference. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, um, but if you do have questions, write a letter to your MP. And if Julie is your MP, write a letter to Julie DeBrusen. Um, Also maybe, you know, just if you're thinking about writing a letter to the government, people who are working on this issue, as you know, she is a, is a leader on this issue. So, 
MP Julie DeBruson. Thank you so much for your time and for, for joining us. I know you have a busy day. So um, we will hopefully see and hear from you soon. Thank you. Great. So um, with that, thank you again, Julie. And after this webinar, we will be sharing everyone's uh, information if you want to get in touch with them directly. Um, but of course, um, we encourage you now to look up who your local MP is so that you can connect with them on local issues. So I will now introduce Chaya, who's Program Manager for Partners in Project Green with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Chaya has over 15 years of experience working with local and international nonprofit organizations and is currently leading the water stewardship and waste management program areas of Partners in Green. So I invite you and now Chaya to um, join and share your presentation with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Let me just share my screen. Are you able to see the screen okay? Looks okay. Great. All right. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present an overview of the Toronto Inner Harbour Floatable Strategy on behalf of all partners involved. Um, I'll not spend too much time on this first slide on the marine plastic problem. I think Chelsea has provided us with a good overview. Um, of the problem and the microplastic problem in particular. Um, I'll just add uh, that the floatables um, do have negative impacts on our habitat, wildlife, through entanglement, habitat loss, ingestion, and also impacts um, recreational opportunities as they can cause damage to boats and are not aesthetic. So what is the uh, floatable strategy? So the concept of the inner Toronto Inner Harbour Floatable Strategy was first realized in 2019 when Ports Toronto led the deployment of trash capture devices, particularly sea bins, uh, in the Toronto Harbour. And they partnered with the University of Toronto's trash team to collect data on the quantity and the characterization of the litter that was collected by the bins. So this strategy was then formalized uh, by the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority and a whole range of partners and stakeholders with support from Environment Canada as version one of the strategy. And implementation of version one through 2020 and 2021 was supported by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. So it's a collaborative strategy with a mission to reduce floatable pollution in the Toronto Inner Harbour through ongoing prevention, monitoring, cleanup, outreach, education, and policy. So stakeholders from across the waterfront have come together to formalize the strategy and implement ongoing projects. It's also a living document with a long-term plan that identifies opportunities, not just to work collaboratively with multiple agencies, partners, and community groups, but also to keep updating the document with new um, solutions. So it's a collaborative effort. Um, it is a partnership currently with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, the University of Toronto's trash team, Ports Toronto, several City of Toronto divisions with support from Swim, Swim Drink Fish, the Harbourfront Centre and Waterfront Business Improvement Area, as well as Waterfront Toronto. And we continue to welcome more partners and collaborators to join us. Partners in Project Green oversees the floatable strategy on behalf of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. So what are floatables? Uh, for the purpose, purposes of the strategy, it's important to just clarify what we consider as floatable pollution. Um, so it's any anthropogenic material that becomes litter in the aquatic ecosystem and is attributed to a variety of sources in the environment, both upstream and downstream. It does not include natural materials such as floating uh, vegetation or woody debris. So our efforts are largely focused on the floatable macro and microplastic litter and any other human-made products such as wet wipes, construction foam, and other solid waste that end up in our streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans. The monitoring data does suggest that the origin of floatables is mainly land-based, uh, urban and stormwater runoffs, sewer overflows, beach visitors, inadequate waste disposal and management, industrial activities, construction, and illegal dumping. So the vision of our strategy 
is to see a city is to see uh, the city of Toronto's inner harbor that's free of floatable pollution and supporting a thriving aquatic ecosystem with diverse and accessible recreational opportunities and a vibrant empowered community we have four objectives to achieve this vision and they are prevention and diversion monitoring and research public education and outreach and policy i'll take you through each of these objectives very briefly so first up is prevention and diversion so we implement novel products which are trash trapping devices and maintenance that will effectively remove floatables within um, as well as that mitigate floatables from entering the inner harbor so we've tested several trash trapping devices and analyzed the findings to identify types of pollutants as well as point sources of the floatable pollution so that we can work with the community to stop pollution at source so these images are some of the trapping devices that we've had in the water this summer. Monitoring and research, we track the volume of floatables to measure the success of implementation as well as to identify potential additional actions. So the initiatives include water quality monitoring, trash tagging to identify travel routes in areas of significant litter accumulation, several research projects which are aimed at identifying the sources of plastic litter and working with the community to pilot innovative solutions addressing them. The third objective is public education and outreach. So we develop education and awareness programs um, such as interpretive walks, webinars and live streams such as this, uh, current uh, curriculum link school programs to highlight the scope of floatable pollution and mitigate behaviors that result in the floatables entering the inner harbor in the first place. We also use our partnership to extend outreach to diverse audiences on the floatable strategy, marine pollution, as well as taking action. So some of these examples will include the shoreline cleanups that Chelsea mentioned, public hosting of trap dive events, where we um, take what's captured in these devices um, and, make a, and make it a public engagement event where you can pick through, sort, and categorize what's been collected. And finally, our last objective is policy. And uh, we use the findings from the first three objectives to policy change to uh, uh, at the local level. And uh, we coordinate the strategy with municipal partners and other stakeholders to support the development of relevant policy. We also focus on plastic manufacturing and the construction industry to reduce pre-production of plastic pellet pollution and foam pollution. So that's it from me. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions now or later. Okay, so we'll save the questions after the next batch of okay. uh, presentations. They all kind of will go together. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll introduce our other speakers who will now take a closer look at some of these initiatives that Chaya just highlighted. And remember, we'll have time at the end to have some questions from you. Uh, so I'll just introduce the remaining speakers. Uh, Jessica is the Manager of Media Relations for Ports Toronto. She has experience in both public and private sectors, sits on many public and government relations committees, which includes her role as co-chair for the Ports Toronto Sustainability Committee. And I'll introduce our other two speakers right now so that we can go through our presentations in order. Um, Megan is from Swim Drink Fish. She is the Toronto Water Programs Coordinator and currently operates the Toronto Community-Based Water Monitoring Hub to provide educational programming and monitoring along the Toronto waterfront. As well, we're joined by Stephanie from Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, Community Outreach and Education Coordinator. And she develops and delivers events across Toronto to provide meaningful opportunities to educate and engage the local community. And we're also joined by Chelsea, who you have already met. So I'll turn it over to Jessica first to speak a little bit more about Ports Toronto. Thank you, everyone. Hey, hello everyone. I'll share my screen. There we go. I think we're seeing the presentation. Yes. All right. Uh, so thank you for that, Susan. Um, again, my name is Jess. Um, pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, with you all to talk a little bit about Port Toronto's contributions to this collective action plan that we call the Toronto Inner Harbor Floatable Strategy. Uh, first, um, a quick moment to provide some background on Ports Toronto. 
Uh, so we have been a city builder and steward of the Toronto waterfront for more than a century. Uh, Port Toronto owns and operates Billy Bishop Airport, the Marine Port of Toronto, and the Etter Harbour Marina, all located on the shores of Lake Ontario <clears throat> and on the Toronto waterfront. In fact, is this connection to the water that drives many of our ESG uh, and community building efforts, including the trash trapping program that I'll speak about today. As a port authority, uh, Port Toronto is responsible for ensuring safe navigation in the Toronto Harbour. In practical terms, uh, this means that we are tasked with manually removing navigational hazards. Uh, so large debris like driftwood, logs, uh, big tires, things like that. With staff skilled in trades, operating vessels and knowledgeable about the harbor, uh, we're also well positioned to operate public works with our partners with the goal of helping to keep the harbor clean. In recent years, as we've, we've heard a bit today, uh, in partnership with the Trashy Mooney or other organizations here, um, we've been working to tackle floating debris and microplastics in the Toronto Harbor through the use of technology uh, and solutions-based research. Floating debris and microplastics come from a variety of sources uh, that my colleagues are uh, better equipped to explain. Uh, but if any of you have been on the Toronto waterfront after a heavy rainfall, uh, you know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, it's a problem that uh, requires an entirely new approach. In 2019, in response, we launched our Seabin pilot program. Uh, the Seabin itself is a trash trapping device. Um, it's essentially a floating trash bin. So some of you may have seen these before. There's an image at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so the Seabin uh, floats in the water, it moves up and down on the surface, uh, and it's equipped with a pump that will suck in water uh, and filter it through a catch basin. Uh, so the catch basin is then emptied on land and the materials collected. Uh, are counted and characterized by trash team researchers. We started with two sea bins at the Outer Harbor Marina in June of 2019. Uh, then we expanded to Pier 6 in October of that same year. Uh, for any who aren't uh, familiar with the Toronto waterfront or aren't from Toronto, uh, Pier 6 is a very heavy traffic area on the downtown. Uh, it's south of the Rogers Centre in Scotiabank. So it's uh, it was a very um, uh, effective area to test uh, test out this material. That was essentially our introduction to trash trapping devices. As you might imagine, um, these devices are not a one size fits all solution, uh, but we've been able to modify existing technology to suit the needs of, of Toronto and our specific uh, waterfront. As an organization, we've been fortunate to cultivate expertise in a number of areas like project management, skilled trades like welding, carpentry, uh, the operation of vessels, for example. And with these skills in-house, we're able to effectively install, maintain, and modify various trash trapping devices, which has led us to some exciting new partnerships and new opportunities in this space. Uh, we've also collaborated with local students to design site-specific trash trapping devices through capstone engineering projects with York University and uh, the University of Toronto. And we're fairly unique among Port Authorities to be taking on projects and initiatives like this. Um, and our team has fielded requests from organizations and municipalities near and far looking to learn from uh, from our experience and uh, and what we've what we've learned from uh, from operating these programs since 2019 uh, trash traps in these in this network have removed hundreds of thousands of small pieces of plastic pollution from the Toronto Harbor uh, each year along with the trash team we, re we release data and findings collected from the previous season and I think Chelsea's got a, a bit of a preview for, your, for you all today. Uh, just for example, earlier this year, we released the findings of the 2022 season, uh, which included uh, a very shocking 105 fatbergs. Uh, so they're essentially rock-like masses of wastewater, diapers, wet wipes, cooking greases, uh, all very unappetizing things um, that end up looking a bit like what you see on the bottom left image on the screen. I think it was the term fatberg itself, but something about this finding really captured people's attention this spring. Uh, and offered us an opportunity and a platform through which we could reinforce that we all need to be mindful about what we're putting down the drain or down the flush. Um, all this to say that sharing data is a really effective tool to help us raise awareness and can drive meaningful change within our community uh, and also beyond our shores. Since 2019, uh, we've expanded the program to new locations on the Toronto waterfront, uh, installing sea bins at locations including P Police Basin, uh, Rees Street just south of the CN Tower, uh, Marina Key West near Billy Bishop Airport, um, and also the Outer Harbor Marina. So quite a few different locations. And we've also introduced new trash trapping devices, uh, including the Waste Shark Aquadrone, uh, 
Uh, so you can see that top right, the orange device. Uh, this August, we were very excited to launch a pilot with the Wayshark Aqua Drones here in the Toronto Harbour. The Aqua Drones were named by public vote. Uh, so the Toronto Sharks called Ebb and Flow. Thank you to Susan, whose name's one. Uh, they joined our Siebens this summer in capturing uh, small debris and plastic pollution from the Toronto Harbour. Uh, you can think of the uh, way shark like a Roomba or a whale shark um, skimming the surface of the water and capturing or swallowing floating debris. They're operated by remote control uh, and they can get into some real problem areas that the sea bins, which are static on a dock wall and move up and down, uh, can't typically reach. So it brings a, a new and exciting capability to the network of trash trapping technology that we're able to use here. Unlike the sea bins, the way sharks need to be physically removed from the water to empty them, uh, but they have a much larger capacity. So the large photo on the left here um, is uh, one haul from the Peter Street Basin on a day in September this year. Um, so that took about five minutes to capture. Uh, so it captures quite a bit. Uh, we really enjoyed piloting the way sharks this fall uh, with our staff and with the uh, trash team researchers. Uh, learning more about their capacity and and how we can best make use of them on the Toronto waterfront, uh, in addition to planning to uh, redeploy them in 2024. Uh, as we know, um, floating debris and plastic pollution in the water is not a problem unique to Toronto. Uh, we know that it's an issue that's prevalent in urban waterways around the world. Uh, but what is unique about Toronto is that we have a coalition of like-minded organizations that have come together to help find innovative solutions uh, to help study and address the issue. So thank you to everyone and uh, all the organizations that are working together toward our collective vision. That's it for me. And I believe I'm passing things over to Chelsea. Off to you. Oh, stop sharing. There we go. Wonderful. Okay, I think everyone can hear me. Thank you, Jess. I'm gonna follow on that to tell you what we do with all of the data um, from the trash trapping that we do. Uh, so the project within our program, we call this um, Fighting Floatables on the Waterfront. And if you go to that QR code, you can learn a little bit about more about um, the work that we do, um, which is a huge part of what we do under the floatable strategy. Um, here's the area in, where, in which we work, if anyone's curious exactly where we um, have our different monitoring and trash trapping programs. And as as Jess mentioned, um, we're really proud to work with students. So we at the University of Toronto work with youth in the form of undergraduates. They are youth, it's 20 to 29 apparently, um, but they lead all of, all of the work that we do in terms of they are the muscle behind the operations. They help us create standard methods, they help curate the data, and they help us use the data to inform um, change as well as to quantify our impact. So when we first started, um, it took a bit of time, you know, to first get some trash traps in the water and to figure out what kind and where to put them. So we had students uh, work with us to design a visual audit where we walked around on the waterfront and we looked at both the big garbage and the small garbage, the microplastics, to look at where do we have a problem, what are the hotspots, and what are the types of traps that might be most effective. The areas where you see the large circles there um, are hotspots, and they are places that both have trash traps today as well as other locations, because we have a lot of traps on the water. Um, another research project that we led in collaboration with Ports Toronto and TRCA was to try to understand where does the garbage go? So when we, when we as in the community, uh, litter by accident or on purpose, uh, garbage into the water, where does it go? And also if garbage comes from somewhere else, is it collecting on Toronto? So we released GPS tagged bottles that we, we, we collected at the end to see um, is the garbage that we see in Toronto our garbage. So we released these, we let them go, we followed them, some we let go from the waterfront, others we let go from a little bit outside. And what we learned is that the litter that we see on the waterfront that Jess mentioned after those rains is ours, it comes from Toronto. So that means the monitoring that we do informs local uh, policy and management actions, and also that we are helping clean and divert our own litter from Lake Ontario. I say our own, I feel like I'm the one littering, but I just mean the city of Toronto. <laughs> um, so these are the oops, the types of trash traps that we currently have. We use sea bins, we use um, litter traps, which are in the ground along Queen's Key on the street. Um, the waste sharks you just heard about, the litter booms, which were um, funded as part of a collaboration with CEC, who you'll hear from later today. 
um, as well as we skim for some of those hard to reach areas, which the way sharks will help us with some of those. But some like you see here are rocky and it's hard to get the glitter out. Um, we care about data. Julie mentioned scientists love their data. With our students, we created two protocols, one to simply measure the amount that we divert in weight. Um, you saw an image that just showed from the waste shark. You saw a lot of plants there. Those are invasive macrophytes. Um, we are removing those from the water and actually our conservation authority is happy about it because they are invasive material. Um, they can also be a hazard to boats. But what we're weighing here is the actual anthropogenic litter, the, the plastic pollution and other garbage we're removing. And we think it's really important to have a detailed protocol that we use a few times a year, about 10 at least on each trap to know what we are collecting and how much. And that informs our upstream projects. So here is a preview of what we collected this year, more than 235 kilograms of anthropogenic debris. So that does not include the weight of the invasive plant material, as well as more than 100,000 pieces of tiny trash. So those are kind of smaller than a toonie or a bottle cap um, going down into two to five millimeter microplastic. We capture different types of microplastics, including foam and film, but also pre-production plastic pellets from industry, as well as our large items, a lot of single-use plastic foodware, cigarette butts are incredibly common among other items that you see here. This data informs our non-cleanup work where we're trying to prevent that material from entering the environment in the first place. These are some of the products we work on that have been formed, uh, informed by research in my laboratory and mainly from work from the U of T trash team. So we don't find microfibers and small paint, for example, in our trash capture devices. So that's why some of it comes from our lab's research. Um, just to give you an example of some of these projects, um, we decided to focus on foam because we see a lot of it and we had a hunch it wasn't all from foodware. So we did a project actually developing a method and demonstrating that more than half of what we see is from construction. So now we're trying to think about ways to work with construction industry in the city to prevent that. In our ditching disposables project, we focus on single use foodware, working um, with advising from the city and we consistently share with the city what we're finding to understand what do restaurants need to be successful and how do they benefit in terms of food uh, waste reduction, but also um, money. They save money by buying less single use products. Also, we look at pellets. We work with industry and the government to trap pellets at the point of manufacturing. This year, we've diverted a millions of pellets uh, from entering our rivers. And finally, on cigarette butts and wet wipes, we're doing more of an educational campaign to help inform people that these are plastic pollution too, and try to give them information on the proper ways to dispose these materials. For cigarette butts, we are seeing this campaign reduce the amount of litter on the streets. And for wet wipes, we have only just begun. So that's how some of our data informs upstream solutions. And now I'll pass it over uh, to the next speaker to talk about the work they lead within our floatable strategy. Thank you. I think that's Megan. That is me. Thank you, Chelsea. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? We do, um, but... You can see present if you can't you at the moment. How now is that? It's, now it's perfect. Okay, awesome. Uh, all right, thank you for that introduction, Chelsea. Um, and thank you everybody for coming out today to learn a bit more about our awesome strategy. Uh, my name is Megan, as many of you have heard, and I work for Swim Drink Fish. Um, I am our water programs coordinator here based out of Toronto and do most of our work and engagement with the floatable strategy. Uh, I'm just gonna start with a brief little talk about who some drink fish is for those who are unfamiliar. Um, some drink fish is an environmental charity and nonprofit, and our main focus is on protecting and restoring waterways. Here in Toronto, we do a lot of focus on the Inner Harbor as it is a big concentration of pollution um, in Lake Ontario. And we do this through various different programs. I primarily work on our community-based water monitoring hubs um, that monitor the water in many, in many places along the Toronto shoreline. Um, and we do this through community science, um, communications technology, um, storytelling, among other things, all as um, all an effort to inspire water advocacy and work towards swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water. So I want to talk a little bit about how our work links to the floatable strategy. So at Swim Drink Fish and at the Monitoring Hub here, 
we do a lot of water monitoring for um, E. coli along with floatables in our inner harbor. So the E. coli links to floatables because we pay special attention to sewage related debris that enters our water via CSOs. And I will talk a little bit more about those in a moment for those that are unfamiliar with that terminology. Um, but it's, it's a main source of plastic pollution and floatable debris in our harbor, along with a huge, it's one of the number one sources of pollution in Lake Ontario as well, um, and degrades the habitat and the aesthetic quality. So it's a big focus here at Swim, Drink, Fish. Um, and by monitoring combined sewer outfalls and um, their inputs, we're able to advocate for a known point source of pollution into our lake and help um, reduce that at its source, which is really cool. So I said CSOs a lot, um, and I throw that word around a lot. It's, it's a big focus. And what it stands for is combined sewer outfalls. And so here in Toronto, much like many other older cities in Canada, we have something called a combined sewer system. And what that means is our, our storm water gets mixed with our sewer water. So um, it's in theory a really great system. And 100 years ago when it was built, I think it worked pretty well. But uh, what happens nowadays is it's it that can't keep up with us. So anytime we get a heavy rainfall or there's excessive water use, essentially the system gets overwhelmed. We can't treat or store the water fast enough. And they're forced to do something called a bypass, which is when the untreated water enters Lake Ontario or other waterways directly. You can see through that outfall pipe here in the image. Um, this is prior to treatment. So anything that goes down your toilet um, or anything that enters the storm drain enters our waterways. And this lovely photo gives um, uh, an image of what we see very often that is indicative of a combined sewer overfall happening. So um, this is what we classify as sewage debris and is one floatable that here at Some Drink Fish we focus on quite closely. In this photo I've circled, um, there's a condom, a tampon applicator, sanitary pad, as well as some of the fatbergs that Jess was talking about earlier. These are all things that enter our sewers, um, enter our waters via the sewer system and are one indication that um, an overflow has happened. And when we pair this floatable um, debris with our E. coli data, it creates a really strong database for um, combined sewer overfalls happening and helps us identify the areas where the pollution is really concentrated and where our focus is, should be. So to give you a bit of an idea of some of the data we collect on floatables, this is from 2022. Um, and these are our various sites around Toronto. Our top three are our Toronto Island sites and they don't have any um, outfalls on them. They're pretty isolated from that. And then as you get down, you'll see some familiar names, Marina 4, Reef Street, we have some sea bins there. And these are also places where combined sewer outfalls are. Um, and you can see, they have a pretty high count of sewage debris. So uh, Marina 4 and Ontario place were our two highest with 119 and 342 pieces of sewage debris observed. And this is just what we physically observe. It's not the total that's there all year. Um, and then I think a number that speaks strongly is the percent of days sampled with sewage debris. So most of the sites, at least 70% of the time, we see sewage debris present. Um, we track other floatables as well, and they're also present basically 100% of the time. We always see microplastics, but the sewage debris are really our main focus and of high concern considering these numbers. So this is our main um, contribution to the program is tracking and monitoring these and helping with that point source of pollution. We also engaged with the sea bins at Marina 4 um, and empty them over the summertime and provide volunteer opportunities to our volunteer base to allow people to engage more with the awesome work and learn more about the types of floatables that are in their waterways. Um, that's it for me today. I have my email up there and it'll be shared with you all afterwards. But if you have any questions that you don't think of during the Q&A, please feel free to um, send me an email. Okay, and I will stop sharing my screen. Right, and I'll start sharing mine. Yes, thank you. There we go. All right. Okay, amazing. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Parrish. I am coming from Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. 
And essentially, my role as a part of the floatable strategy is really to work with community uh, outreach and engagement, and really making the topic of floatable litter something that everyone can get passionate about. So in terms of the work that we do here at TRCA, um, we have access to a number of different opportunities and programs and partners that we work with, not only within Toronto, but across the greater Toronto area. So we have recreational opportunity, nature hikes, family events, citizen science programs, seniors programming, early years programming. We do a variety of litter cleanups, educational booths, and have access to a variety of uh, large scale festivals and events across uh, the GTA, which give us an opportunity to really be able to engage folks in the world of floatable litter. And beyond that, we have a number of uh, partners that we have here in the GTA that we can work collaboratively with, not only on educational opportunities, but have them come out and contribute to some of the action um, as a community to reduce floatable litter. Uh, so we have a number of opportunities here and really truly when when it comes to the world of floatables ed education, we have been working on a number of kind of microplastics programming within schools and the community as well as litter cleanups over a number of years. And now we are really taking that information and creating a more targeted approach to support the floatable strategy and really help educate um, children and, and the community in terms of how they can take action against floatable litter. So to really just highlight some of the work that has been done as a part of this uh, Floatables Collective, I just want to highlight some of the activities that we have done over the last few years and then kind of showcase what we are hoping to emerge into. So as I mentioned, we are just kind of starting this realm of focusing our work within the Floatable Strategy when it comes to outreach, but we are really hoping to dive a lot deeper in 2024 and continue to grow into the future to create new and exciting opportunities uh, to engage the public and as I said, make them passionate about floatable litter. So one of the uh, great interesting programs that we uh, ran in 2022 and 2023, these were general awareness programs. So we had a program called Today's Catch Floatable Litter Awareness happening down um, at Marina Key West, an opportunity for folks that might just be walking by using the recreational trails to kind of grab their attention, pull them in and, and talk about floatable litter. So this was an opportunity for folks to actually be able to do some magnet fishing not so much floatable, but magnet fishing uh, within the harbor there, as well as engage them in some waste categorization activities and teach them about the floatable strategy and the importance of the actions that they can take at home. We've also run a number of, uh, we've run water waterfront walks, sorry, bit of a tongue twister, uh, to be able to educate the public as well as our partners in terms of what is being done along the harbor front through the floatable strategy. We have had litter cleanup events, um, specifically as it relates to this collective and partnership. TRCA has been running litter cleanup events uh, for quite a long time, but specifically to this partnership, uh, this year we were able to run a cleanup alongside with Don't Mess With The Dawn um, that allowed for uh, a really great opportunity to, to uh, remove litter um, along the shoreline of the ravine. And so this area, we had about 77 cleanup volunteers and we filled about 55 or 50 trash bags um, filled with with litter within the area. So this is this group photo here um, just showcases some of our amazing volunteers as well as the litter that we were able to pick up within the ravine space. Uh, we have had uh, trash dive events. So these are opportunities in working uh, with the University of Toronto in terms of their uh, osprey traps uh, to be able to actually collect some of the the um, uh, the waste that is being collected and have the opportunity for the public to be able to support in the characterization of that data. So really helping them kind of sift through and understand what is moving through the ravines, what is moving through um, the harbor front. And so being able to have that visualization um, of fatbergs or what, what's being caught in these traps is really, really helpful to com the community to understand what's in their waterways. It's also an opportunity for us to educate generally on microplastics and floatable litter. So again, just a great um, opportunity for awareness. We had about 16 community volunteers that came out to the trash trap uh, dive event in August of 2023. And, you know, considering we had inclement weather, it was, it was pretty rainy, you know, having these volunteers, they were really dedicated to the work and it was nice to see that passion ignite in our community.
Other projects that we've been working on, we've had a few public engagement sessions. Uh, so uh, running a partnership, TRCA worked with uh, the Bentway through a microplastics workshop, whereby um, we partnered with uh, an arts group called Studio Rat, who repurposed plastic bags in order to make an inflatable art piece that we were able to enter uh, and then do a workshop on um, microplastics and uh, the floatable strategy. So that was a really interesting and unique opportunity to engage a community that might not have otherwise come out to say a litter cleanup event. And then as well, uh, working um, to run a collective kind of presentation as we're doing today at Patagonia. Um, this was a really nice opportunity to engage about 38 members of the public to come out and provide a networking opportunity as it relates to floatable litter and the um, actions that communities can get involved with. So what's coming up in 2024? Well, I mentioned that really what we've done so far is just the starting point of our community outreach and education. And we are really hoping to grow in this next year in terms of the number of outreach and action events that the community can get involved with. But then beyond that, be able to create new ideas to really uh, entice audiences that may not be as passionate about uh, floatable litter to really get them out and get interested in this issue. So coming up in 2024, we'll have about 16 ravine and shoreline cleanup events really to get people out to kind of have that action. Um, we'll also be working within schools to run very specific uh, floatable litter related school programming. So we'll have about six school programs um, and then as well leaving those schools with kits for them to be able to go out and uh, conduct cleanups within their local ravine spaces here in Toronto. We're going to be continuing those awareness and trap dive activities. Um, we are also hoping to run some plastic pullback events. And this is really just an opportunity for us to kind of create something a little bit more showy where uh, folks might be able to come out to a repair cafe, uh, a reusable market, or a Halloween costume swap where folks are maybe more engaged in the activities that they can join. And then from there, create an opportunity to raise awareness about floatable litter and the floatable strategy. We'll be continuing our microplastics workshops that we do publicly and virtually. We are also hoping um, as a 2024 to initiate a community impact mapping tool. And essentially this is going to be an opportunity for folks that are involved in floatable litter cleanups or pellet blitzes or trash dives to be able to um, add what actions their community groups are doing within Toronto that work against floatable litter. So we'll be able to input information about um, the waste that these groups are picking up, uh, the area that they've been able to restore, and how much litter they've been able to remove from the environment. We'll continue our pellets, uh, pellet blitz events, and then as well, we'll be working on a community educational art project um, in order to be able to showcase the impacts of floatable litter on our aquatic ecosystem. So lots of things coming up for 2024, and we'll continue to add to that list, and hopefully into 2025, we'll have even more to share. So that's it from me. Amazing. Okay, so I'm just going to put this slide back on the screen um, because we do have a bit of time for questions before we turn it over to have questions from us for you in the discussion portion. So as a reminder, um, you can use the chat to type things in as well. We can, uh, if you use the raise hand feature, we can unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Um, and I will start with a question for our speakers currently is just to share shortly a highlight you've had from your time with the floatable strategy. And so I'm gonna take down this Q&A instructions, but feel free to use the chat if you're unsure of how to ask. I guess I can, I can dive in with my yeah, response. Say, sure. sure. Go Jessica and then we'll uh, um, do. Sure, uh, I'd say my highlight uh, was uh, one of the, the first days that we uh, piloted the way sharks down at Sugar Beach. Um, so this was just a regular, I think it was a Wednesday morning, um, but we had our orange way shark out in the water. Uh, it's very visible um, and it uh, we happened to have uh, a sugar ship at Red Path Sugar that was departing the Port of Toronto. There was a paddle boarder in the water um, who paddled up to the, the way shark to get a good look and, and um, the people on the ship were on the on the deck looking down at it wondering what it was and then there was also people you know walking along the dock wall at sugar beach coming up to us asking us questions and i thought it was just such a good example of the power of this technology to capture people's attention and really get them thinking about 
you know, why is this thing in the water? Oh, it's capturing debris. Why is the debris there? What can I do uh, to help uh, prevent this from happening? So uh, that was definitely one of my highlights for sure. Amazing. Okay. Um, we'll just go in order of the faces I see then on the screen. So Chelsea, you can go next and then Steph and then Megan. Sure. I think for me, it's been the cross-sector collaboration and the friendship. I mean, it's been really fun to get to know everyone we work with. And then selfishly as a professor, the students love it. They're always talking about, oh, I want, you know, how do I get Megan's job? Or how do I do what Steph does at TRCA? We have engineers talk to Jess and Juhi at, at Ports to learn about, you know, ways in which they can get involved technically. So I think it's been the collaboration and friendship and learning from each other. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to echo off of that, it's the collective impact of like very passionate people. And it's the power of community as well. It's not just one solo organization trying to to drive action against an issue. It's it's a whole group of people that continues to grow and grow and and meeting each other's passion and sharing ideas has been has been really great. So it's been a highlight for me. Yeah, I, I feel like to from a personal note, I agree. It's really it's really awesome to work with people who are equally as passionate, really inspiring when community groups can come together and, and have collective action. And that's really amazing. But what I've also find really cool about this work, it's really amplified what we do. Um, having the sea bins in areas that we monitor water, like we take volunteers out and they see that the water is dirty and then actually having them sift through the bin and picking out what we visually see is just on a whole other level. And I think it makes people really appreciate more the things that they've like learned about through our work. It really amplified that. Um, and and it's really amazing to to see how that pairs together. I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Great. Okay. So uh, we do have a question in the chat currently from David wondering for Jessica, if you can comment more um, current, um, on the hours of in-water operation versus charging maintenance for versus human resources for the waste shark. Yeah, so one thing about the sea bin is that it's sort of a plug and go situation. You install the sea bin and it, uh, I mean, of course, daily emptying is is uh, obviously a human, uh, human resources requirement for the sea bins. Uh, the waste sharks themselves, obviously, um, they need to have a pilot. So there needs to be someone on uh, the, the dock wall, for example, or on shore operating it by remote control. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that the um, way sharks do have the capacity, they have the capability to be automated on a prescribed route. That's not something that we're doing in the harbor uh, in Toronto just yet because uh, it's a very busy harbor. So there's a lot of, like I mentioned, ships, paddle boarders, canoes, kayaks. Uh, so it's it's a bit more complicated for us. Um, but I just wanted to note that because it's a, a neat feature of the te technology. Um, it is uh, in terms of charging uh, and uh, its hours of operation. So it should last about six hours on one charge. That's something that we've been trialing this year. Um, I I have not had the, the pleasure of actually plugging in the device. Um, so I'm not sure that I can answer the question as um as to how long it takes to charge. I don't want to put my colleague Juhi on the spot, but I do know she's on the call. If there's anything she could add on that note. Uh, yes, I have it written down. So I'm pulling that up because I okay. don't trust my memory. Fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, so again, this is something that uh, we were looking into this year as it was our first sort of trial with these devices. So um, yeah. I Yes, if I can jump in, one charge takes around four to five hours. And like Jess said, the waste truck can then go for six hours. Um, and yeah, we can in one run capture up to 160 liters at a time. And uh, we're also hoping to pilot a removable basket next year, which will hopefully make it easier to magnify the volume we can collect in one go. This Thanks, is a great way to kind of highlight where the data that we collect really comes into play when we add these new devices there's a lot of trial and testing and the data can not only inform what type of plastic is out there but also about how the devices operate themselves and what's effective um so i'm gonna bring john uh, i saw your note in the chat so we'll unmute you um john is with don't mess with the dawn to ask your question to everyone okay great thanks uh, everybody it's um, awesome to be here with you thank you Thanks for all you do. Um, my question revolves around uh, behavioral change. And I I noted that when Julie spoke, she talked about uh, 
cleanups being a good way to involve people, awareness of the problem, new people coming to the issue. Uh, you've all in one way or another spoken to the idea of education and outreach and even Chelsea with students wanting to be involved and, and uh, being out there visibly and uh, physically to, I guess, involve people who happen to come by or, or involve in your organizations. But so I guess that's great. Um, I think I'm wondering if there's anything more we can do in terms of behavioral change. So that's, or maybe that's what Steph was talking about, outreach and education in schools, which is awesome for kids to know what's going on and, and see how they can help add pressure to their parents, I guess. Um, I think I'm I'm wanting to open the question of uh how can what what can we do more in the area of behavioral change? Because um we pick up a lot of garbage. You guys do a lot of great stuff. Um around litter and floatables and and we could you know we could keep doing it <laughs> and doing it and doing it and then i think part of the work we're all trying to do is how to stop it or how to reduce it mitigate it and i guess that comes from people waking up to okay this we just can't do this anymore and so i'm curious if anybody has any thoughts or comments on the effect of the outreach and education or work we're all doing on behavioral change. So definitely a topic we all consider quite a bit. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Steph. Um, I imagine you have some insight on this. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting problem for sure because I, I have witnessed um, more and more in terms of the kind of outreach that we're doing. It often tends to be the, the same people that keep coming out. It's people that are very passionate about plastics and Really, my goal over this next year is really trying to convert our outreach into groups that wouldn't normally come out to a litter cleanup event, that wouldn't normally come out to a, a plastics related event, and working towards how do I reach those folks that that yeah, wouldn't come out to those events or aren't necessarily passionate about it right now. And how do I get them to be passionate about it? Because that's where behavioral change is going to happen. The folks that are really interest, interested in the plastics problem are already having those conversations with their friends and family. So that outreach already exists there. And I'm sure that there is action happening amongst those folks. It's really the community members that that just don't know. So how do we reach out to them? And it's, it is something that I'm trying to think about constantly in terms of our outreach initiatives of reaching those new people. Um, so that for me is a is a really big goal for the next couple of years of, is how to reach them in terms of continued behavioral change. I mean, again, it's it's really based around continuous education and conversations and outreach. And um, I'm, I'm sure others will speak to it is, is really supporting that policy change as well. Um, OK, so I think Chelsea might have some insight as well. A number certainly some of our research has. Um, address this topic to a degree. Go ahead, Chelsea. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in just to add, and, and I think TRCA has these as well, like our, you know, how to reach those audiences. We have school programs um, and our lesson plans are available on our website for people to beg, borrow and steal. But the idea there is going into schools and trying to increase waste literacy with kids. And um, Rafaela, who hasn't isn't a speaker in this, but she's controlling the spotlight and everything right now, but she has her PhD in um, social science. And so she's been leading interviews with the kids and actually seeing you know, whether that information is sticking and how it changes their behavior. And then the other thing I'll add is for some of those upstream solution projects, um, you're right, John, eventually we'd like to not have to clean anymore, right? And to prevent it upstream. Um, so for cigarette butts and for our single use foodware projects, um, those have been mainly around educational campaigns and working with, you know, restaurants directly to have them pilot different solutions to reduce um, single use foodware or for cigarette butts kind of helping increase awareness that cigarette butts are plastic pollution. And with that, we have seen changes. You know, we have seen restaurants make changes and want to change. And we have seen a reduction of litter of butts on the ground as people increase awareness. So I think behavior change is hard. It's as hard as it is to change policy and behavior change is necessary alongside it, but it's critically important. And so I think, you know, with everything we try to do, we try to increase literacy. And even with our cleanup, you know, we have educational campaigns around it and and I know you guys too with Don't Mess With The Dawn. So it's really awesome to see what everyone's doing locally. Uh, to keep us on track and on time, because we really want to hear from everyone else, um, I'll answer this last question that was in the chat um, from Beth, and then we'll transition to the next segment. 
Um, I was curious about volunteer opportunities for the public and are they more seasonal, um, et cetera. So if you're in Toronto, um, pretty much all of our organizations, um, some of the projects that Stephanie highlighted um, will be doing again and others were in the planning stages. So it's great that there's already interest <laughs> in getting involved. Um, a lot of our you know, cleanup things kind of take place seasonally starting as early in the spring and continuing on through the summer, early fall. Um, we will be sharing all of our organization information. So the best way to learn about those is the majority of us have newsletters you can sign up for and social media to follow. Um, so <laughs> if I listed all of the opportunities, we'd be here for much longer. So just the short answer is yes, there's quite a few and depending on it, um, the seasons will vary. So thank you for that question. Um, we will now turn it over to everyone, um, but I do encourage we've been, I've been sitting for a while. So if you wanna stand up or, or not stand up or just stretch in your chair, just take um, the next you know, 10, 15 seconds to do a big stretch. And then we'll turn it over to Stephanie and Chelsea who will facilitate more interactive discussion with all of you. So thank you so much everyone for those talks. Awesome, yeah, our next session um, which is our last main session, the goal is actually to hear from everyone here. Um, so we had that Q&A and it will lead to discussion that Steph's going to lead. And the goal for this session is really to learn from each other about what we're individually doing as organizations on this issue. So we can share ideas and collectively brainstorm new ideas for local strategies to work on prevention, reduction, and cleanup, to motivate collaboration so we can all act local. But um, that was a mistake. To act local and think global is what I should have there and then discuss how to create a community of practice where we can continue to share ideas. So just for further motivation of why the sharing of ideas can be really important, we've had some really huge successes and I know some have some other groups within our organizations have as well. Uh, Ports Toronto and U of T Trash Team started our trash trapping program together in 2019, starting from discussions as early as 2017. Um, that has led to our project growing, but also to um, informing and influencing or motivating really the Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup, which is um, started from a conversation with the CEO of Ports Toronto at the time and the head of the Council for the Great Lakes Region to basically find funding uh, for Pollution Probe and CGLR to put trash traps across the Great Lakes. And we also collaborate closely with an organization in Vietnam, MCD, um, where together we've created those vi visual audits uh, methods and they also created a trap uh, from scratch, which inspired us to think about how do you create your own trap? Um, and they currently do that on the Red River in Vietnam. Um, and then from there, we were inspired basically to start the International Trash Trap Network, which is a global community of people trashing, tra trapping trash, also hard to say, together under the International Coastal Cleanup with Ocean Conservancy. And just for an example of how uh, our work can inform policy, because we haven't talked about that too much, our first ever pollution prevention project was trying to understand how microfibers from our clothing go into a washing machine, into a wastewater treatment plant, and then end up in the Great Lakes or in other water bodies. Um, with two undergrad students, we tested filters on washing machines and we found that they reduced the amount of microfibers going to a wastewater treatment plant by 87%, which will also reduce the amount going into the environment. Uh, we had a PhD student at the time, Lisa Ertel, who started a collaboration with Georgian Bay Forever. And they had this idea to scale up what we did and actually bring washing machine filters into this, the town of Perry Sound. We got them in the homes of 100 volunteers. And with that, we actually saw a significant reduction of fibers at the wastewater treatment plant scale. With that, we could think about how this would scale up even more, say for the city of Toronto or a big city like Los Angeles. And our data has been written into policies in France, in Ontario, in California and other places um, legislation has passed in France. It's gotten really, really close in California and Ontario, um, but it's just an example of how this local work can truly scale up. So the goal of the next session, Steph's going to lead us through an interactive session, not us talking anymore, to learn from you and think about how we can all continue to make big change. Perfect. All right, everyone. So I'm actually going to move everybody over uh, away from Zoom, stay on Zoom, but uh, we're going to head over to a Google GM board uh, just to be able to share some ideas. But before we get started, I'll walk everyone through a quick demonstration. So if you want to just watch my screen just for the first moment, uh, just to get a sense, does everything look good in terms of what you want to see? Perfect. All right. 
So essentially, this is what our Google Jamboard is going to look like. Everyone should be able to have access regardless of having a Google account. If you are having any trouble logging into the Jamboard, please, please, please just put it into the chat. We'll have our team members just support you in terms of getting access. Um, but essentially, this is what our, our Google Jamboard is going to look like. So we have a number of tools that we can use to be able to share ideas. Uh, so I'll walk through a few features here, and then we'll actually get into our questions. So first and foremost, we're all going to stay together on the page as we go along. There's a few questions and ideas that we're going to go through. Um, but if I can get everyone just to kind of stick together as a group as we move through this process, that would be wonderful. If you have an idea, a comment, you want to share something, uh, the best way for you to be able to do that is head to this side panel over here. You'll see there's like a nice little oval shape. The fourth one down is a little sticky notepad. If you click that, you can kind of just click in your or type in your idea. You're welcome to change whatever color you want to or just leave it yellow. And then you hit save. So you'll see there at the top corner, my new sticky note uh, has been added. From here, I can move it around. I can make it bigger. I can make make it smaller, whatever you want to do. If you start to notice any particular themes that start popping up and you want to group your ideas with somebody else, you're absolutely more than welcome to. Um, make sure that as you're working on um, as you're working on your sticky notes, you're just being mindful of other people's sticky notes. As editors, everyone does have access to be able to edit or delete other people's work. So just be mindful of what you're doing. And that includes also, um, you know, if you accidentally move something around, you can fix it. So if you notice if somebody accidentally kind of flips theirs upside down, you can just drag it from the top uh, left corner uh, to be able to put it right side up. If you need to edit your note at any point, simply all you need to do is click on your note. You'll notice a little dot, dot, dot at the top right corner here. And then you can hit edit in order to change the text that's within it. If there's a particular idea that you really, really like, I encourage you to use some of the hearts on the page uh, to add to a particular idea. So you can either take one, click, drag and drop on a particular sticky note, or if you're noticing we're running out of hearts, if you simply just kind of uh, click on it, hit Control C, or if you are on a Mac, uh, Command C just to copy it over, and then Command V to paste, or Control V to paste, you can then move your Part over to a sticky note uh, that you would like. If at any point you make a mistake, um, control or uh, command Z will help undo that if you need to. Aside from that, that's pretty much it. Hoping everybody kind of understands uh, and we'll move to the second page. So if you notice on the top of the jam board, you've got one of four. If you just hit to the next frame, you'll see our very first question. So my question to everyone is, what are your groups or organizations uh, and what are you doing to reduce or remove floatable litter from your community? So if you don't mind, please just make sure that you specify what group or organization that you're coming from today, as we don't have access to that on the Jamboard compared to Zoom. And if you could just let us know in terms of any of your community action projects or your specific programs and projects that you're doing within your organization, that would be really lovely. Uh, and if we have any time, I might even call upon maybe one or two folks to maybe share a little bit more of their information. There will also be a follow-up survey as we're waiting for everyone to input their information in their sticky notes. There will be a follow-up survey that uh, will be coming through to give you a bit more opportunity if there's something that you thought about later or really need an interesting project that maybe you're not a part of, but that you've heard of and you wanted to share. This survey will allow you to be able to kind of input some more of that information that, that we can share collectively. So Eco Superior is already coming through. So host spring cleanups to reduce garbage for the public groups and education. Perfect. Anyone else out there? All right, another one has come through. If you don't mind just uh, editing what organization or group you're coming from. So we write policy briefs that share what we learn with policymakers locally to inform solutions. Uh, Government of Canada representative, regulatory and non-regulatory policy at the federal level to take action on single-use plastic pollution. Amazing. All right, a lot more coming through. City of Calgary, we've had great success with uh, pre-production plastics pollution prevention. Uh, we need much more effort on other plastic pollution sources as discussed. 
greener future. Uh, we collect, whoops, things are moving around. We collect litter from the shoreline to prevent litter from entering Lake Ontario. These are great. So I'm going to start maybe grouping these in some of the themes. And again, if you did want to like a particular uh, action, uh, feel free to use some of the hearts on the top corner. Uh, Town of the Blue Mountains, working with Georgian Bay forever uh, to host cleanups and locate diversion receptacles. Perfect. Am I missing anything? See, easy. We create tools and guides to support local action. These are all really wonderful. All right, I'll give folks maybe one more minute to get their information through. All right, a few more. Litter traps uh, in the harbor, also trap in a drainage grade and looking for more locations in the drainage system. Blah, blah, it's delivering on our strategy. Oops, I missed that one. There we go. Uh, there we go. Okay, sorry, everything's moving around really quickly. <laughs> delivering on our strategy to make um, all of our in-store plastic packaging and control brand plastic packaging 100% recyclable or reusable by 2025. That's great to hear. Uh, U of T, City of Calgary, uh, Oh, this is a note to City of Calgary. Perfect. I'll move that one over over to uh, our City of Calgary. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. All right. I think we'll we'll head into the uh, next section again. If there's something that you forgot to add, feel free to come on back and uh, just you can add it later, or um, feel free to add more information if you need to. So at the top again, we're going to head over into our next frame. If that's okay with everyone. So really, this is a, a big piece is that we are all doing a number of really amazing projects and creating action in the community. Um, but we're all somewhat working separately in a lot of ways. We're maybe building partnerships with a few other organizations, but how can we collectively make an impact across Canada to reduce floatable litter? So this is an opportunity to just understand how, how can we share ideas? You know, when we are coming up with new uh, methodologies for research, or if we are um, you know, finding new uh, equipment or or things like the the waste sharks. Uh, how do we share those ideas uh, with other organizations and municipalities or or other government levels? How do we share um, new outreach initiatives? This is uh, an opportunity for you just to come up with a few few things. So. Uh, one possibility is maybe creating like a discord channel where folks can continuously uh, share information, project ideas, links, new research. Uh, maybe that's done through an emailing list. So I see a few um, suggestions coming through here. And again, this is really where the, the hearts on the side are going to be of great use. If it's an idea that you really particularly like, give it a heart. So uh, regular working groups. I think that's a really wonderful idea to be able to kind of maybe even on a, a quarterly or biannual basis to be able to share what's going on within our particular initiatives and the, the successes that we've had and maybe also the lessons learned. Um, Social media, follow each other, but also boost each other's work. Absolutely. We're actually going to get into that one in a little bit. Sharing resources on our websites where organizations can learn more about what they can do locally. I think that's absolutely great. Sharing data to inform policy and strengthen campaigns. Collective policy advocacy. Absolutely. More Indigenous partnership to incorporate traditional knowledge and support plastics pollution prevention efforts. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Quarterly meetings, Slack channel. Absolutely. Ask community members for problems and feasible uh, proposed solutions. More kind of community one-to-one -one engagement, absolutely. Interviews, whatever it might be. Having a list of emails within our network so that we can collaborate on campaigns, et cetera. I agree. I think there's a great opportunity for all of us to kind of share our resources and ideas and, and be able to kind of transfer the amazing work that's happening either in Toronto or in Vancouver or in Calgary and be able to kind of shift that amongst our, our various organizations. So it looks like here, you know, a lot of people are, are looking at different methods of engaging other folks into these discussions, which I think is an absolutely great idea. Um, and in terms of sharing the resources that we have within our organizations, some of the key messaging that's look, that's coming up is, yeah, having some kind of channel, whether it's through social media, email, Discord, Slack, to be able to share our ideas and research as it comes up. And then also potentially maybe creating these working groups um, where we can kind of collectively come together and, and share what's what's happening and provide updates. I think that's great. And thanks everyone for using the hearts to, to share what ideas you're you're enjoying. So I think that's great. Perfect. Okay, we have a few more coming in. Sharing resources on waste diversion, anti-litter communications, uh, for example, messaging, posters, et cetera, that can be borrowed from 
uh, for community use. I think that's great. And I think CEC is really going to kind of speak to that a little bit later as well. So that's a great resource to be able to share. All right, everyone, we're going to head to the final page, if that's okay. Um, and someone already really kind of spoke to this is, but how, how do we highlight each other's work? You know, some of us are, are working on amazing projects. It's a great opportunity when we're doing community outreach to talk about, you know, what are the successes that we've had with not only the floatable strategy, but also just floatable work across Canada. So how are we, uh, you know, we can share ideas and messaging through, um, you know, the ideas that we just came up with on our last page, but how do we want to highlight? Is it through social media, for example, um, to, you know, support a particular organization as they've posted, hey, here's some amazing work we've just done. Is it, you know, retagging someone or um, creating a collective hashtag maybe? And when we have done something amazing that we wanted to share with the world, um, you know, we can use a, a collective hashtag together uh, through social media to share that. So share local successes from other organizations to our own community leaders to inform change. I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. Um, a lot of our organizations have our own particular networks that we're working with and to be able to kind of bring what other organizations are doing to the table to kind of share ideas with them, I think is great. And great suggestion for a uh, hashtag, act local, think global. So here um, we have Fighting Floatables TO, which is one that we often use um, for the work that's happening here in Toronto, but maybe uh, as well, yeah, one that, that works across Canada and that might just be Fighting Floatables. Create an Instagram group profile or Instagram message group that we can share certain posts we wanna be shared out. Uh, that we can share as a group. Okay, so it would be like a collective Instagram account that that all of us have access to. I think that's a great idea. Host events that provide a platform for others to share about their work, like workshops. Absolutely. And I think, you know, stemming from today, you know, people, what you were sharing in that first slide about the work that you're doing, I would love to be able to have a little bit more time to call on people and and really have them speak to, to the successes of the work that they're, they're doing. So I think that would be a really great opportunity um, or have more panel sessions like we've had here today um, to, to share those insights. I think that's a great idea. All right. I think I've pretty much covered it all. If you've got any more, feel free to to cover them. Um, just trying to figure out if there's any ones that I've missed. Okay, so it really, it looks like here today, in terms of what we've been able to cover, it sounds like there's some amazing projects and programs that are happening. It sounds like through the comment section, people are uh, in the in Zoom, people are really looking for more opportunities to spread outreach as it relates to floatable litter. Um, and I think there is a really great opportunity for us to potentially start working towards building some form of network amongst us, as well as other organizations that you might be aware of that weren't able to join today, um, but might be interested in joining that network. Um, and perhaps creating um, some form of email communication where folks can, uh, through an email list, where folks can share ideas and then coming together um within an annual, biannual, or quarterly basis to provide some key information about what projects uh, you're working on and, and what changes have come up. So I think those are our are, are great insights and initiatives. Uh, if you think that there's any organization out there that would be interested in perhaps chairing um, some form of uh, kind of networking group that can meet, um, that I think that would be a, a really great initiative to start. And then in terms of sharing each other's work, um, absolutely, uh, you know, bringing and drawing attention, um, bringing the information from meetings like this uh, to be able to share with your local community leaders to inspire them to take action, I think is is huge. And also having them perhaps even join some of these networks um, to to hear from the leaders who are working on on plastics pollution reduction um, and, and can then take their information to their communities. So I think that's a great idea, start engaging more actual community members in the work that we're doing. Um, and yeah, absolutely through social media as much as we can, maybe start using hashtags to, to kind of really amplify the voices of, of all of the amazing work that is happening across Canada. So we will take this information. And as I mentioned, we're going to send a follow-up survey that will sort of bring together all of this information uh, and allow folks to, to really really kind of narrow down what our next steps are. So thank you everyone for sharing today. Um, if there's anything that you forgot to add, or if you have an idea later, the Jamboard will be open. So feel free to come on back. You can add more 
more ideas and insights um, and, and share uh, some more love for potential um, other ideas that are on the Jamboard. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, I will pass it back over. Wonderful, thank you, Steph. And on the um, spirit of sharing, we have one more presentation for today before we um, close up our workshop. Um, and that is to introduce the CEC's campaign, Last Stop the Ocean, which is a fantastic campaign. You've heard us talk about it a little bit. Um, CEC is the organization who basically um, supported and motivated our idea for this workshop. Um, but they have three projects across North America right now. Well, maybe more than three, and Catherine will tell us about them. But basically within Canada, within the United States, and within Mexico. And so we're one of the groups working in Canada, but basically the goal is to create a campaign and resources across a larger region. So I'm gonna introduce um, Catherine. So I wanna turn it over to Catherine Boyd Michaud from CEC, who A, as I mentioned, has supported this workshop and a lot of the work that we do, um, but B, created an amazing campaign, Last Off the Ocean, that um, she'll share. So Catherine is a project lead at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. She has been since 2021 with over seven years of experience in multi-stakeholder projects and initiatives at the local, regional, and also international level. So really thinking local to global. As part of her work, she strives to bring together government representatives. And as I mentioned within this project from Canada, Mexico, and the US to tackle pressing environmental challenges, which includes plastic pollution. Um, Catherine ha holds a master's in maritime spatial planning, a BSc in environmental geography, and a minor in project management. And I'm going to turn it over to Catherine to share a little bit about this campaign. Thank you. Go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Chelsea. And thank you for the the whole uh, <laughs> the whole presentation there, introduction. Uh, first, I want to say it's really been a pleasure to work with the University of Toronto trash team um, as part of our reduction of marine litter project. So let me just go in presenter mode. Here we go. So I think we should be good now. Um, so as mentioned, that I'm a project lead at the CEC. Um, and one of my main goal here was to present you two tools that we had developed to help uh, communities take action to reduce marine litter. Um, but I'll just quickly exact quickly say a few words about the CEC. Um, so we are an intergovernmental organization that was established in 1994 by the governments of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Uh, and our mission overall is to facilitate cooperation, to conserve, protect, and enhance the North American environment in support of sustainable development. So we work really on a bunch of topics from marine litter, air quality, food loss and waste, um, and a bunch of things in between, green growth and so on. And we don't do that alone. For sure, we work with our uh, our lead agencies, Environment Canada, Samaranat in Mexico, and the US EPA, but also other um, government agencies, academia, local indigenous communities, and so on uh, for our work. In terms of marine litter, I mean, we had a great introduction with all the presentation and, and Chelsea's intro. We know it's a major global environmental issues uh, that needs to be tackled in so many different ways by different actors. Uh, in our case at the CC, we've been focusing on uh, reducing land-based marine litter through local action. Uh, so since 2017, we have developed a different project and we always try to empower local actors to prevent marine litter at the source. We target inland communities. Uh, we focus on visible litter and implementing low cost, low tech solutions. Um, so as Chelsea mentioned, the current, uh, the current workshop or the current activities is part of our, our current redu reduction of marine litter project. And as part of this project is that we're working with three communities, one in each country, so Toronto, the Quad City areas in the US, and Chiapas de Corso in Mexico, really to, um, well, yes, reduce marine litter by putting trash capture device, but that's just one part. The big part is also getting the citizen involved in the public awareness, so creating those citizen science activity like the, the, um, the dive that was organized in Toronto and workshop to develop local action plans. Um, so since 2017, different projects were, were created. Uh, and one thing that we did here was that there was a need for how-to guides 
as well as a need to raise awareness on marine litter and link it to behavior. So I know that was one of the questions earlier, so I'll touch upon it a bit. I know we are at the end of our, our session, so I'll try to touch upon it a bit to explain how we went about it. Um, but as I wanted to present uh, two products that we had developed, so Toolkit for Community Engagement and the Last Stop the Ocean uh, public awareness campaign that we have been developing. So the first one, the uh, the name of the toolkit is Reducing Marine Litter Through Local Action, a toolkit for community engagement. Um, so we've seen a great example of organization doing this with the U of T trash team and their partners. Um, but basically this tool was developed for uh, community members or community group NGOs uh, to give them really a simple step-by-step -step guide of how they can uh, develop different type of action. Uh, so here, our target audience is quite wide. Um, this document is available as a digital publication on our, our website, the CC's website, in English, French, and Spanish. Everything that we do is always uh, in those three languages. Um, the audience for this toolkit uh, is more for adult audience or maybe older teens. Uh, it's written in really an accessible way, a step-by-step -step guide, easy to follow with templates and examples uh, related to the different steps. Um, the toolkit has four parts that you can go through uh, from the beginning or the end or just focus on a specific section that you need. Uh, it includes starting with defining the vision, uh, who do you need to be involved, what type of funding you may need to, to go get, um, to how to bring different people together, highlighting five different type of engagement activities. So pop-ups, cleanup, organizing workshop. And for each of those type of activities, there's really a clear step-by-step -step things to consider, the time does it take to organize it. So for organizations that haven't started, uh, this can be very useful. Um, then the third section is about plant planning and implementing solution and it includes specifically uh, how to create perspectives to really uh, explain what you're trying to do as well as how to develop action plans. And then the final one, the next step. So how do you sustain momentum and build your engagement over time? So this is really a quick overview. Um, it is available on our website if you want to peruse it and see if this could be relevant for you, especially in the case of this workshop, this webinar. Uh, I know the UFT was trying to reach out to other organizations that may not have uh, this, might not have their local floatable strategy or their local action strategies. And so this can be a place to start to help you um, take action. The second one that was also mentioned is the Last Stop the Ocean campaign. Um, so this is a public awareness campaign that focuses on land-based marine litter and its journey. Uh, so it includes a website with educational material, um, as well as a set of ready to use public awareness campaign material uh, to help show shift individual behavior around waste and littering. Uh, same thing, all the material, English, French, Spanish, and is available on the laststoptheocean.com web website. And the thing that's interesting here is that it was really designed to be used by other organizations. So by yourself as part of your own effort. So you can add your logo if you need to add messages to it, or if you need to add any type of information linking it to one of our events, you're more than welcome to do so. It is available for free for download and for you to use and to really make your own. Um, as you can see, the campaign uses more like playful characters to illustrate the universe of everyday single use litter, mostly plastic. Um, one of the reason is for it to be relatable to different groups, especially for the CC as we work in the three countries, we wanted to make sure that the images used could be relatable to the three countries. Um, the audience for the campaign here. So we were targeting, there's a lot of campaigns that exist around marine litter and plastic, the impact of plastic and so on. In our case, it was uh, targeting people that are aware that marine litter, that litter is an issue, but they're not necessarily taking action. Um, so is that they know littering is not great, but they don't necessarily know that if you, you know, 
don't discard your trash properly, like in parks or overflowing bin, well, it, there's a good chance that it will end up in the sewer system, in the rivers and so on. So that's why a lot of the material is targeted toward, towards showing that, that journey. Um, also, since we're targeting people that are not really taking action, uh, the campaign really showcase, showcases easy solutions. So easy step that can help nudge people from just knowing it's an issue to actually taking action. So yes, if the garbage bin is full, don't just put your thing on the side, like just carry it to another bin or don't throw your trash on the ground or reuse your material and so on. Um, so there's really a lot of material the public awareness campaign, so it includes the website that has a lot of information. It also includes material for digital social media types of ad and strategy. It also includes uh, material for print ads, whether it's in journal, newspaper, bus stop, that, that type of stuff. So the formats are available to be used in that way as well. Um, as I mentioned, there, there, have been room left for you to add your own logo or any type of key message that you want. And uh, so this material is already available and ready uh, to be used on the Last Stop the Ocean website. But also if you're interested in learning more how you could use a campaign or if you need help to develop one, we will be hosting webinars and workshop in the coming uh, months, so February and March. Uh, in order to do so, same thing, workshops in English, French, and Spanish. So stay tuned and definitely don't hesitate to reach out if you're interested in using the material. Sorry, Chelsea, I sigh. I took more time here. Um, but if there's any question, always uh, you can reach me by email or, or if there's time now. Thank you. No problem at all. Yeah, I think we'll, if you have questions, go ahead and reach out to Catherine or reach out to CEC. Um, and I'm going to go ahead, since we have four more minutes and I want to end on time, I'm going to go ahead and just put up the final slides of the workshop. And there we go. Hopefully it should be on your screen. And basically, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming, for um, taking part in the discussion section that staff led. It's really exciting to see what everybody does. Um, and I really think it's important, you know, the what Catherine was just mentioning and all the work we're doing, thinking about how we can stay in touch. I think the collaboration and sharing what we do is really key. You know, so often people kind of work in silos or they try to come up with, you know, reinventing the wheel to have the bigger, the brighter, shinier thing. But I think the reality is that we can all learn from each other and share ideas. There's a few sayings I've learned over the years in teaching and also just working in the space. And one is work harder, not smarter right? Thinking about learning from each other to come up with ideas that other organizations prove work in their location. Um, another is we're stronger together. And two more that I, I maybe sound a little funny, but one is beg, borrow, and steal. As a teacher, we always beg, borrow, and steal ideas. And I think within, you know, different NGOs and community organizations, it's okay to do the same thing, right? If something works in one location, let's mimic it and do it in another. And the second is mimicry is the finest form of flattery. I really find it to be awesome that CEC and CEC, I want to give you a big shout out and thank you that they've come up with a campaign that they're just giving to people. We will have this campaign in subways in Toronto in a few months. We've put all of our floatable strategies logos on there, but it's truly their artwork, their vision, um, their educational materials that we will be using. Um, so I want to give them a big shout out for what they're doing basically to amplify solutions. Obviously, I want to thank all of our partners within the floatable strategy who truly have become our friends over the years. It's been wonderful to work locally with stakeholders on our waterfront. And finally, again, just to thank everyone for coming and think about the ways in which we can stay in touch. So we took notes. Basically, we talked about sharing emails. Um, we talked about having a joint hashtag, um, boosting each other on social and potentially a message board. We'll take over all those those ideas forward and think about it. And I think Steph said, if any organization wants to chair that or spearhead it, please let us know. We're happy to have you do that and to take a take part in that. Um, so please do stay in touch. And after the workshop, um, we have been recording. So Susan will share the recording. We'll also share the slides. So everything is a resource to you. And our website is here if you want to learn more about any of our organizations and the work that we do. So. Uh, a follow-up survey will come, as Steph mentioned, so we can learn a bit more from each other and think about ways to improve the work that we do. But 
Thank you so much for coming. I hope you have a great day and a great rest of the week. And um, hopefully we'll be in touch soon. Thanks everyone.